Hello, and welcome to Building High Performance Cultures, a weekly series where we talk with executives of top organizations on how they've built high performance cultures and how they're lever leveraging their culture as competitive advantage. I'm Marty Parker, the president and CEO of Waterstone Human Capital, and my guest today is one of the co-founders of WE, Craig Kielberger. Welcome, Craig. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to join you on the new podcast. Yeah, thank you, and it's a pleasure to have you here. A little bit about Craig, for those of you who may be under a rock and don't know about him, but you may not know some of these things, that, that would be few of you. Craig is clearly one of the world's great social entrepreneurs. And along with his brother, Mark, he co-founded We Charity, which provides a holistic development model called We Villages, helping to lift more than a million people out of poverty in Africa, Asian, and Latin America, and it'll be more soon. Uh, and in the United States, Canada, and the UK, We Schools and We Day provide comprehensive services, service learning programs to, and I probably, by the time I, I mention this, it'll be outdated, but 18,000 schools and engaging 3.5 young change makers, young and old as well, I would say. He's also the co-founder of Me to We, a pioneering social enterprise that profits, the profits from which help sustain the work in his charitable organization. And if you can believe it, uh, Again, this is probably outdated by the time I mention it, but he has received 15 honorary doctorates and degrees for his work in the fields of education and human rights. He's a New York Times bestselling author. He's received the Order of Canada, the Nelson Mandela Freedom Model, and the World's Children Prize, amongst many, many more. And in 2015, Craig and his brother Mark, also an exceptional individual, were named Canada's most admired CEOs in the public sector. And we is also a two-time Canada's Most Admired Corporate Cultures Award winner, most recently in 2016. And I wouldn't be surprised if very soon again. Craig, again, welcome. And I think everyone, most everyone is familiar with the larger story of we. But just in case, why don't you give us a little background on maybe the history of we and where that's taken us to today? Marty, it'd be a pleasure. I, I do have to take one step back to your very gracious introduction. You, you were kindly ran through some of the awards and some of the impacts. Truly the award recognizing the corporate culture, uh, that is one that to this day is still our greatest pride and joy. So thank you for the, the rigorous approach that you put into measuring that across the country and celebrating that uh, just as important as you know, financial performance or just as important as frankly any other measure of impact to understand the impact that we're having on our own team members. So that is uh, deeply appreciated. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Craig. Uh, to answer your question, it was actually 25 years ago this year uh, in fact, uh, just last week, we were celebrating our anniversary. Uh, one day, read a story about child labor in the local paper and made me so angry. I tore it from the newspaper, brought it to my class. I was 12 years old at the time. And we started this tiny children's charity. We started calling other charities. We said, we want to help. People looked at us. Uh, other charities didn't really know what to make of us because we were a group of kids. And we, we realized that, that there gave birth to our mission of making doing good doable. So a little bit of a unique mission because half our work's at home and it's still around empowering young people, you know, youth who do service, uh, helping youth with mental health and to improve their own lives, getting young people involved in local and global stadium events that celebrate youth making a difference. And the other half still remains on the global side, uh, really helping on international development, helping kids in those countries. But so often how you empower a young person in a part of Asia or Africa is with education and clean water. So that empowerment is still a really critical part of who we are and what we do now, 25 years later. Tell us about, I mean, 25 years, 25 years and a 37 year old talking about being involved in this for 25 years. <laughs> if that's not unprecedented, it's awfully close. But tell us about the culture at we both, how it's evolved and, and where it's come to today. Oh, I think it's evolved a lot. Um, and then in some ways it hasn't. You know, I, I look back at some of the great moments of the organization's evolution. Part of the culture, I think, is framed by our mentors. You know, I'll never forget when Oprah gave us a, a remarkable gift. It was millions of dollars when, when my God, I was like 15, 16 at the time. Um, and honestly, we had no business getting a donation of that size as we started this tiny children's charity. Um, and, and she said something in that moment that I'll never forget, um, where not only did she pledge to build 100 schools with us, but she pledged to provide the legal and the accounting and the financial and the operations and, and really kind of funded the equivalent of our ABCD venture capital round. And she said, it's easy to do good. It's hard to do it well. And, and that idea became a bit of a mantra for us. It's easy to do good. It's hard to do it well. There's a lot of well-intentioned actions out there. But part of our culture is around 
you know, truly measuring impact around the world. It's around sustainability in the developing communities we work. It's around empowerment. You know, how we reinforce the culture is through a whole series of touchstones. I, you know, I'll, I'll never forget when, again, I, I think a lot of culture is rooting in your early days. I'll never forget that when we were kids, we got called um, shame, we got called idealists. So often we got called young and dreamers and idealists as if it was a negative thing that to this day we still print in massive over office walls, shameless idealist. You know, we walk in and you see that because that part of our culture just became a, a touchstone for us, a rallying cry that yes, we, we believe in a world without poverty. We believe in a world where youth are empowered to change the world. And, and then so much of, of culture is both in, in how you recruit. Now so many of our staff are actually alumnus who have grown up through our youth program. It's in how we point, um, I'm sorry, how we onboard. We have an extraordinary process where, you know, when we onboard our teams and staff, they're mentored, new staff, older staff to get to know each other and understand. And it's in constant reinforcing. Every two years, for example, we organize a staff trip to go, it doesn't matter who you are, you know, you could be the frontline receptionist, you could be the financial, you know, CFO to get a chance to go uh, and see and, and touch and connect with the projects around the world that are so critical to who we are, what we do. And that reinforces the why, that purpose behind us. And, and so I, I, what I'll say is we are far from perfect. We always strive to be better. That's actually part of our cultural norms also. But culture has been something that even, even when we have failed, it has been always with the best of intentions and remaining true to the original vision of why we created the organization, always with the spirit of continuous learning. Wonderful. You know, if shameless idealist is the worst thing that someone can be called, then bring it on. I, that is fantastic. I like that. Craig, talk about your own leadership style and maybe more broadly, um, you know, what, what role do leaders play in the culture at WE? I can tell you the style that I hope for. Okay. Uh, I, I think the, I, I think I'd ask, you know, 50 people around the organization and they can hopefully always hold a good mirror and, and reinforce when we're on track and off track. But I, I once had the honor to spend time with Nelson Mandela. And like, you know, what do you ask Nelson Mandela? You've chat with him. Uh, and I asked him, um, you know, what he saw as his greatest lesson on leadership. And, and I thought that he'd maybe talk about, you know, uh, the anti-apartheid movement. I thought he'd talk about, uh, you know, being in prison for all the years. And he talked about how when he was a child, he was so poor growing up that he and the family didn't think he'd go to school. And, and he didn't even have a pair of shoes. And, and he was a shepherd. He basically would lead his flock from the pen to the pastor. And he remembered the first time when he was a kid that he had to do this. He doesn't remember his age, but you know, five, six, seven, somewhere in that ballpark. And he unlatched the pen and he started as the leader to lead the sheep and to lead the goats out to the, to the green grass and pasture. He started to march ahead, but they didn't follow. And he remembers getting all upset and kind of shouting at them and stomping his feet. And his family was watching this because this was the first time that he was doing this. And, and he remembered them cracking up laughing. And of course, he got even more angry as a result and the kind of the shape and just, you know, stupid sheep and stupid goats and he's shouting, oh, why don't... And in that moment, as he stamped his feet and he tried, he realized that the only way to get them from where they were to where they were meant to be was actually to go behind them and to gently to move them forward. But if, if anyone was actually on a hill watching this unfold, they would see, you know, these goats and these sheep, you know, moving their way, going to where they're supposed to go. And behind them, <laughs> they would see this young boy almost running to keep up, a little to the left, a little to the right, to, and, and the last one to get there and the last. And I remember when he told that story, this idea of true servant leadership, this idea of you lead your flock from behind was his greatest lesson. I, I look at the organization, and, and in some ways, you know, my brother and I are still very involved because, of course, we're, we're speaking, you know, on the We Day stages or we're, you know, fundraising or we're sharing the messages. Um, we get to envision new projects. That's the part I love the most now. Um, but truly, so much of the day-to-day -day operations is such that we, step by step, have had the honor to work with such incredible team members that they are now building and carrying the organization further than we ever could imagine in legal and accounting and finance and operations and tech and all the critical functions across multiple countries. So 
you know, I, I, I dream of the day that, although I think, you know, as long as we have the privilege to be involved in the organization, we will maintain a lot of the, the envisioning for the future with the senior team. But today, you know, honestly, if we were hit by a bus, the organization, the charity would be perfectly fine. And I think it's because the culture is such that they lead and we have the honor to empower them in that process. Wonderful. Wow. That's, uh, that's, gr- that's an incredible story actually, and must quite a privilege to, to be able to hear it from someone like Nelson Mandela. Yeah. Now, you describe, and many people describe, we as a social enterprise. And obviously, we're hearing a lot more about it. I think we're, we're launching more social enterprises, more entrepreneurs are social entrepreneurs than they would be pure commercial entrepreneurs. But how do you define a social enterprise, um, Craig? And, and, you know, Talk a little bit about why it's sustainable to have a social mm-hmm. enterprise. Yeah, so, so allow me to share that. So, so WE is a movement, it's an organization. It's a, you know, and, and within WE, there's really two core divisions in some ways. You have WE Charity, which is exactly as it sounds. It's a, that legally registered charity. And then you have uh, me to we which is you know, the legal social enterprise, which earns income through the sale of products and services to fund the charity and sustains our work. And, you know, other examples of social enterprise, Goodwill, obviously, you know, you drop off items and they resell it, very famous social enterprise. Uh, there's something called the ReStore. It's, it's, it's a partner with Habitat for Humanity. So they will collect, you know, items from your home renovation projects and they'll resell it onto the open market. Maybe the world's most famous social enterprise is the Grameen Bank. It is a, it's an operational bank founded in Bangladesh. And it has been credited with lifting about 300 million people out of poverty by pioneering microcredit. And actually its founder, uh, Mohammed Yunus, won the Nobel Peace Prize for this. So the whole idea of a social enterprise at its, at its simple root is the combination literally of those two words. You have a social mission and you're applying an enterprise or a business market solution to accomplish that social mission. And it's great particularly for whether it be employing at-risk populations, bringing certain products to scale, creating recurring revenue streams for nonprofits or certain causes. On, on how ours came to be as kind of the context, we were working in Sierra Leone, West Africa, and we realized that we were gonna run out of money for some of our development projects. And we actually went to one of our very generous funders, a man named Jeff Skoll. He's uh, the billionaire you know, who started eBay, uh, along with his friend, Pierre Milliard. And, and Jeff said, sure, I'll help you, but not in the way you're asking. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm not just gonna write a donation check. I want you to help, uh, I wanna create with you a social enterprise, which would retail products from the communities we worked around the world. And his line was, when you look in parts of Africa, the communities just see, and, and people in the developed world, just see a need, but there's actually an opportunity. Women with amazing traditional build, you know, beadwork skill set, or in our South American communities, coffee, for example, that we retail, or chocolate that we retail. So we started initially with, with a simple retail of goods. It's now grown so that you know, we have everything from technology licensing that we do for Fortune 500 companies to track their social impact through geo-targeting and tracking transparently impact through their supply chain and delivering impacts around the world to you know, divisions from trips and travel to in-office coffee service. It's grown beyond our wildest dreams. And it has for us a couple of advantages. Number one, we don't do black tie galas. We don't do street canvassers. We don't do telemarketers. We don't do Sunday morning commercials. No disrespect on that, but it's all expensive. And we'd rather earn the income to fund the charity. Um, And it keeps our admin costs low. Uh, Number two, when we partner with these companies, I believe that companies have a moral responsibility to also do good in the world. And a lot of them are led by extraordinary leadership and they have employee bases who want to do good and they're looking for the how. So we can create opportunities to leverage that and actually grow the pie. Instead of charities fighting over the same fundraising dollar, we can grow it through several partnerships. Uh, And last but not least, the very act, even if the social enterprise didn't make a dime to fund the charity, the very act of the empowering workers who are creating through good jobs, products like the coffee in our communities, the very act of of, tracking social impact to move companies along this line, it actually is the mission. And so I, I think as we hit this really tough post COVID-19 world, I'll kind of finish with this by saying, I always believe in traditional charity. There's always a role for it, but I think we need to be more innovative today. I think companies need to be more innovative. I think charities need to be more innovative and social enterprise is a great option for mission driven, 
whether it's for-profit entities that want to tap into the power purpose, whether it's nonprofits that are looking to diversify their funding, or even whether it's a foundation to an ultra high net worth who are looking to not just give a donation, but to actually make an investment. In many cases, to get their capital plus back. But, and in the process, they're actually forwarding a social good. This is the future of how we can unlock the power of impact. Craig, you, you, you bring up, I think, a series of questions we could ask. But let me ask you this one. If, if you're an entrepreneur or a CEO of a business today, and you're saying, I really want to understand and unlock the power of our purpose on my journey towards being much more of a social enterprise, uh, and, and to really, truly, for all the right reasons, um, you know, to, to, to uh, almost like that karmic business model, if you will, right? That, that the more good you put out there, the more good will come back. But really, they feel strongly about it. How would you start? How would you advise them to start? What I would say is fundamentally how most social enterprises start is not in the business section of a newspaper, but it's in the A section. Find any problem in the world, and odds are there is a business solution to that problem. In the A section of the newspaper, we see hunger, poverty, we see climate change, we see you know, COVID-19 now creating health challenges. And often it takes a while before that mitigates over to the, you know, the B or C, whatever the business section is in the newspaper. And fundamentally, being a social entrepreneur means looking at the A section and saying, these are the world, my communities, my nation's problems. How can I put together a earning revenue model that solves this? And, and I don't mean to be that simplistic, but that's it. You know, it, it's just like any great you know, enterprise. You got to you know, figure out what your product is. You got to figure out who your team is. You got to figure out you know, how to get that and logistics. And, but, but being a social entrepreneur is, is seeing the world through the lens of not only problems, but opportunities to be solved. Really interesting. I want to go back to culture and talk about your own organization for a second. And I want you to think back, maybe this is an unfair question to put you on the spot, but can you think of a time or an example at we or at the movement uh, in general, where you would, you can say today that, you know, I don't think that would have happened if we didn't have the culture that we do. Oh, many. You know, I, I, here, here is one of the, the early moments that I remember was actually one of the toughest moments ever in the organization. I, I remember, so when we first started, our mission was, was to literally kick down doors. Before we were known as the We Organization, before stadiums, before all this, we were actually called Free the Children. Right. So anyone who's Canadian who remembers back the late 90s, mm -hmm. that's when we first kicked off. And in the true spirit of that, we, we literally would free children uh, around the world in some really terrible situations, human trafficking, brick kilns, factories, brothels. And we would bring these kids back to their families. And, and we thought that that was what we were meant to do. It was the highest manifestation of our calling. Mm -hmm. And then in the months, and sometimes even six, 12 months ahead, we would check in on the kids and see how things were progressing. And we quickly realized that for a lot of the kids, we we'd find they'd end up back in the same type of conditions because although we physically freed them and brought them back to their families, we hadn't changed the fundamental state of right. poverty that was backbreaking and it was terrible and it's what drove these children into these terrible situations in the first place. And the families were so desperately poor they'd have to pledge or sell their children again. And I remember in those moments, you know, a, a lot of thoughts went through our mind. The first was, you know, we're confused as to why some charities just keep doing this because they have to know this truth also. But, you know, it was a lot of funding and people, you know, it was in the media and kicking down doors and celebrities. And, and so, you know, I understand why some charities do. You know, then another thought ran through our mind is, should we just give up? You know, this was, you know, you know and, and I remember, you know, in this process, a part of the culture that, that I hope is, is, is fundamental still to our DNA of starting so young is the fact that we had the humility to recognize that we didn't have all the answers and to ask for help. And, and that's part of the culture, literally to ask for help, to ask for help of your colleagues in the organization, to have the humility to ask for help of people who, you know, big CEOs. And, and, I, and I believe, in fact, really some of those powerful words in the world are, I need your help. And it's amazing just saying those four words, how they can change a conversation, even with, you know, presidents and prime ministers who have sat down with on this. And we sat down with the community, the parents of these kids and said, you know, I need your help. We, we've failed here. We don't understand. How, how can we be better? How can we better serve you? 
And they would say, well, we need schools as alternatives for these kids. We need, you know, water so the girls don't have to walk far distances every day. We need, you know, food security programs so we don't, you know, out of desperation have to sell or send our children. We need small businesses so we can afford to take care of our kids. Listening and learning ended up rebuilding. We, we turned to our funders and said, I need your help. You know, this is, this is not working. We need to rebuild the organization. The, the, the humility to admit what wasn't working, the grace to acknowledge when you need help. I know this is very counter the idea of leadership today. It, you know, leadership in the kind of Trump era, in the very loud era, even the, you know, the Jack Welsh era, and that type of you know, idea of what it means to be a leader. But I actually think this is starting to win over. You know, someone who I'm, I actually had the pleasure to call a friend and, and I see pretty often is Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft. Mm. And he is a soft-spoken individual. And I'm amazed how many times I've heard him turn to someone and say, I need your help. And, and I think those four powerful words we've mastered in the nonprofit world, but I think are not sufficiently part of the wider culture across corporate Canada and corporate America. No, I think you're right. And I think you're really onto something there. And yet um, it's so simple. <laughs> it seems so simple. So Craig, as you look back or forward even, um, and as the growth and the changes that, that we has experienced, um, you know, what are the most important lessons learned and, and maybe even what would you do differently knowing what you know today? You know, the, you know, is it the, the Drucker quote, culture eat strategy for breakfast? You know, I, I, I fundamentally believe that to be true. And, and, and that's not what I would do differently, frankly. That's, that's what we would do the same again and again and again. Like if, you know, we, we may have, we like every organization, we are far from perfect. Um, and particularly when you start when you're 12, you know, frankly, we had no idea what we were doing half the time. Um, but I will say the part I, I look back and I'm really proud of is the culture, is being able to you know, acknowledge where we failed, continuously learn, you know, take care of those around us, be shameless idealists, lean in towards the mission. You know, where, where would I have done things differently? A lot of operational aspects. But you know, at the end of the day, that's the strategy part. That gets eaten by breakfast. You know, it, it, it truly, I believe that quote is so bang on. You know, the, the final thing I'd say that, that when I look back, and this was a unique case for us, perhaps, but, but not in some ways. When you look at business across Canada, we forget that 70% of business is family business. And when you actually look at uh, the Fortune 500 in the U.S., 40% still have a, a, a controlling share, which is a family-based entity, it, which, which is pretty amazing if you actually stop and realize how sticky this is globally and how much business globally is still, you know, often multi-generational or, you know, pretty wide, but, but a lot of Canada business this way. Um, I had the pleasure to do this with my brother, Marty, you know him very well. Mark, he looks up and spends a lot of time with you. And, and, and I, I look at the privilege of being able to build something together with family and how extraordinary that's been. And that's something I wouldn't trade for the world. In fact, you know, in Canada, we talk about this, there's six years between us, so we weren't particularly close growing up. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we each kind of had our own lives and this is really what brought us together in this way. And, and I look back and, and working with people who you want to spend, in my case, so far 25 years with, and I know I want to spend the next 25 years with, you know, that's, that's your life. That's a massive amount of time. And life is too short otherwise. So, so finding those who you trust, who you want to you know, connect with in that way, and then build, build, build like crazy. 100%. I, I had the pleasure to work with uh, two of my brothers, one in our organization before he retired a second time uh, in Vancouver, and another one who's been an advisor for all 17 years and who I worked with for, uh, for five years before that. And it, it truly is a privilege. Um, and uh, and uh, it, it has taught me an enormous amount, not only about myself, uh, but about the enjoyment and pleasure of, of being with people who you respect, family or non-family. And so Absolutely. I would agree. I would agree. What do you see looking, looking out? You know, what trends do you foresee coming? Maybe, maybe they're facilitated a little bit by what we're going through now, maybe not. But when you think about building a high performance culture, in 25 years, that's longer than I've been building a business. Uh, which is an incredible, incredible advantage you have. So what trends do you see in terms of building high performance cultures? 
Great question. You know, let me say the obvious ones and then get to the little less obvious ones or that are more connected to our mission. The obvious one is we're going to see a continued evolution uh, because of COVID-19 and other factors towards digital engagement. You know, you, you and I would have just sat down face to face two months ago and done this. And now today, you know, this is the, the nature of our world. In our case, we serve 18,000 schools and overnight, literally, we had to pivot to online delivery mechanisms, emails into families' inboxes with lesson plans every day and live broadcasts so the kids can keep learning online when they were even at home. You know, we days, filling stadiums suddenly became digital events where you have to hire touch, engaging with celebrities and having chat rooms where youth can pose questions and our staff can answer live questions to support them. Like, you know, we're, would we have gotten there anyways? Probably, because that's where the world is going. But, you know, we certainly didn't expect to make the transition as quickly as it has. Um, and, and so I, I look at the technology side um, as, as the obvious. You know, that that's, you know, it's, it's, it's almost a footnote, though, in the scheme of things. What does that mean to your point on culture? It means the need to create more resilience and, and, and cultures that embrace change on a higher frequency. It's almost cliche to say, but we're going to continue to see an extraordinary amount of unprecedented months ahead of us. What does that mean in tangible terms? You and I were having a conversation a little offline on this. You know, I, I had the pleasure uh, to talk to everyone from, you know, Craig Wright, the chief economist of RBC this week, to, uh, you know, head of Walgreens, to some of our hedge fund friends, to friends in government. And, and everyone acknowledges that even after there is the vaccine, the impact that this has on economic uh, levels, the unwinding, in essence, of our economy is going to push us, you know, far into 2021, 2022. They recognize the behavior modification that this is going to be a tough time, tough for nonprofits, tough for businesses. This is not a quick bounce back. And so we need that resiliency. We need that focus. You know, in, in our case, we support a lot of youth with mental health resources. Interestingly, we now find companies who are increasingly reaching out to us to say, you know, these things that we're giving to children of our employees, can we get some older versions, especially the prevention part, not the, you know, there's a lot of corporate groups that do late stage intervention, but really the prevention promotion aspect resiliency, change management. I also think we're going to see a drive even further for purpose. What's going to come out of this on the other end is a lot of hardship. The truth is you don't bounce back from 30 million jobs lost in America overnight. You don't bounce back from the fact that, you know, the data we just saw a few days ago from economists showing here in Canada that even by the end of 2021, you're going to still see double digit unemployment in Alberta. Like these, these are scary realities. You know, when you look across Canada, where we are. So, so given this reality, people are going to want to make a difference. And they're not going to be able to do it always in the traditional way of just reaching into their wallet and pulling out a 10 or a $20 bill for their favorite cause. But I do believe it's the ice cream effect. You know, why in times of recession does ice cream sale go up? You don't get a chance to go on a vacation, so you buy yourself and your family an ice cream. I think when it comes to doing good and purpose, people are going to want to make an impact and they're going to shop for brands, especially consumer brands, that infuse more good into the fundamental purpose. They're going to lean into companies that in small but meaningful ways help to make an impact on the causes we care about, health, human welfare, I'd say also climate. I think there's a hyper-realization of how connected the world is. So leading with purpose, it may sound counterintuitive because people might say, no, 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 we're going to cut back. I don't believe that at all. I think purpose is going to become an even greater differentiator because people know that others are suffering and these others are their neighbors, their friends, their aunts, their you know, nephews and nieces struggling for the first job. Those who, who show that value driven in purpose, I think will very quickly lead the way on a faster rebound. So I think it's, it's resiliency, I think it's change management, and I think it's purpose driven culture. Okay, I've been this week uh, doing some um, spending a lot of time in the future workplace culture. Obviously, we're at the center of this. We get asked about it. And you hit on four of the five of what we think are the underpinnings of the changes of workplace. Uh, I'm curious. What's the fourth? <laughs> what did the, I miss? The fifth is you. It's, it's leadership. And, and a more uh, dynamic type of leader can lead in a more distributed digital world where we're going to have to have more empathy and give more trust. And uh, not only the systems, as you say, the digital systems will have to enable, but as leaders, we're still people. And, uh, and we're going to need the courage uh, to be able to, to lead and know when we need to bring people together and know when we can't or don't need to bring people together. So there's a, there's a lot. Um, and I don't think we 
are near figuring it all out yet. But, uh, you know, you, you have the benefit of a lot of experience as an entrepreneur and a leader at a young age, and that's going to be more valuable as the days go on, I think, not only in terms of uh, what you can share with others, but how you can bridge the gap. Uh, because if I'm talking to my 20 or 18 or 16 year old or 24 year old, uh, it's a little different than, than someone like you talking to them. And so uh, that's a big opportunity that we have. And, I, and I'm, I'm going to close on one final question. And that is thinking about that young entrepreneur uh, or, or leader that is looking to start a high performance journey as a high, in, and build a high performance culture. What's the one or possibly two pieces of advice that you would give her or him? Top piece of advice, an amazing board, mm. hands down. And, and I know it may seem an unusual piece of advice to jump to so quickly. The truth is life experience and a diversity of life experiences matter. And, and I don't care who's the most successful CEO in the world who's had the most extraordinary journey, they, they can only live and, and walk in those particular shoes. To have a collection of individuals around them, a diverse collection, extraordinarily important on culture, on learning. Um, I, I can't emphasize that enough. I, I, I fundamentally think that when I look at our success, it's because we were able to stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, and, and I look at whether, again, it's a young entrepreneur, frankly, an older, it doesn't matter to me. We, we actually have a, an incubator accelerator where we help social enterprises. And, and I give this uh, piece of advice, and it always causes a bit of a head scratch because, you know, it's not what people expect me to say, but I'm saying like, fundamentally give so much thought to how you build your board. Uh, whether it's a legal board or whether it's an advisory board, doesn't matter. But who are the people you're going to surround yourself with? Who are those who are going to hold you to be accountable? Who are going to stretch your thinking? Who are going to bring new ideas to the table? Who, who's who's your, your kind of wisdom group that you turn to? Um, and, and you were very kind a, a moment ago in, in your, your comments um, about my age. And, and if I could actually broaden that, it's interesting because I actually look at so many boards in corporate Canada and just boards generally for that matter and feel that there is a lack of the voice of young people. Of anyone, and when I say young people, I mean like under 50. <laughs> so a yeah, very inclusive definition of youth, I'm missing 20s, 30s, 40s even. You know, and I think it was so interesting that Walmart brought, um, brought three people under 40 onto the board recently, which I think tells you something about how they view technology in the future and purpose and generational trends. And, and I think that actually has an impact on things like you know, board's view on climate or board's view on recruitment of young employees and livable wages and you know, on strategy on purpose, et cetera. So, so my advice to, to anyone building their culture is you don't have to build it alone. Carve out that board, that advisory group, formal or informal, um, stack it with the smartest people you know, uh, and, and, and really ask them for the candid advice. You know, ask them to hold the mirror up, ask them to be there for you. Uh, it's extraordinarily helpful. You are the company you keep, as my father used to say, and, and certainly uh, we're so fortunate in our business uh, to be able to keep great company, and, and uh, you're certainly at the top of that list, oh, Craig, perfect. and we, we really appreciate that. And, you know, here's to making uh, doing good doable, and here's yeah. to all of us being shameless idealists, quite frankly, your lessons on empowerment and mentorship and how to really um, cultivate a social mission. The lessons learned are exceptional. And uh, on behalf of all of our listeners, I just want to thank you for taking the time today uh, to, uh, to, to share your lessons and your thoughts and your experiences with us. Oh, Marty, thank you. And thank you for continuing to hold up culture and, and to challenge leaders to be better and to, to create learning opportunities like this. And, and honestly, it was an honor and privilege. So thank you for being among the first on this mm -hmm. new wonderful platform. Well, thank you. Um, and join us next week for another episode of Building High Performance Cultures. And in the meantime, if you want to learn more about this topic, visit waterstonehc.com. And here's to uh, being a shameless idealist. I love it. Thank you again. Thank you so very much, Craig Kilberg.